thank you, uh, friends and colleagues. Welcome to the 51st event of Habitat Forum's uh, webinar series on rethinking city, especially rethinking the Indian city. As you probably know, we started last June and have covered many urban themes from slums to mobility, to governance, to water, to technology, to housing, to sanitation, to climate change, to economic growth, to sustainability. Even Gandhi and city, we have had over 280 urban experts, professionals, and specialists share their ideas, views, thoughts, and perspectives on better planning, better management, and development of our cities. We had more than 50 partners, local and international, in organizing this webinars. While we are on 50, 51st webinar and hope and plan to continue more, is only appropriate to ask and share with you why we are doing this. What is the purpose and what do we hope to achieve? And that is time has come not only to live in cities, work in cities, grow and prosper in cities, and dream our future in cities. It is time to think about cities themselves. As COVID-19 has shown, an impending climate change and global warming are telling us the time has also come not only to think about cities, but rethink about our cities. Cities are no longer asking for investments in money terms. They are asking for investment in new ideas, new perspectives, new vision, new technology, new creativity, and new ways of bringing economic growth, wealth, prosperity, happiness, and durable peace to our people. It's not only COVID and climate change that are asking for new ways of doing things. It is the slum dwellers, migrant laborers, polluted rivers, depleting water table, and deteriorating air quality that compel Delhi High Court to describe Delhi India's political capital as gas chamber. All these are calling for rethinking our cities. It's not only lack of development or inadequacy of development, but also nature and outcome of development that is increasingly deepening inequality in our cities that necessitates rethinking. Cities are engines of growth. They're also site of the greatest inequality. We need to figure out what is it about the city as a system that generates so much wealth and so much squalor at the same time. The question is, who does this thinking and rethinking? Only the governments, only the planners, only the professional, only the politicians, only the World Bank? No, that's not enough. The condition in which our cities are and could be in 10, 20, 30 more years if we do not change our ways and do not tell ourselves that the governments, professionals, and consultants thinking alone is not enough. And if that happens, our problems will multiply, we would have greater crisis on hand. Ensuring better cities, inclusive cities, productive cities, sustainable cities, people caring and environment friendly cities 
is a wider societal responsibility. Not only governments must find answers and solutions to the problems, not only they must find alternative ways of doing things, we as a society must invest energy, skills, wisdom, and resources in finding new solutions and alternative ways of doing things. This webinar series that we are running for almost a year now on Rethinking City is an effort to take the urban challenge to the citizens, to the wider society, to you, to me, to younger generations, to people who teach and train professionals. It is to convey to everyone that the urban challenge is daunting, even if silent. We as a country, we as people, we as government cannot afford underperforming on that front. As the price for not meeting the urban challenge squarely is indeed very high. Both quality of, quality of large number of our people could suffer. And also, cities being growth engines, our ambition for a $5 trillion economy would also remain a daydream. There is a moment. Things are beginning to happen. Under such Bharat, Pradhan Mantri, Ava, Sojana, Amrut, Smart City, Mission, and many other programs and activities, things are happening. But much more remains to be done, and nothing less than a wider societal effort is adequate to meet the massive urban challenge. We need a progressive societal partnership for better cities and thereby a better India. The series that we are running for last, last one year is a very small effort in that direction. We tend to do what we know to do, but in the urban context, time has come to do, to doing what is required to be done. And as we know, it is uh, different things. That said, let me just spend one more minute on this particular webinar. That was general introduction of FinHAP's effort at this webinar series. Today's webinar, title is very long and interesting. It talks about heritage conservation in the emerging Indian city, the future of 20th century architecture in Indian cities, and learning from Chandigarh, Delhi, Ahmedabad, and Mumbai. This webinar has an eight-member strong expert panel giving the views, and for a change, we have been able to manage gender balance rather well, the five women and just three men. This is being uh, anchored by two distinguished uh, professionals in uh, Punam Varma Maskarhas and, uh, and Vinay Bhaneji. Before I hand this over to the, to the, to the anchors, I need to introduce these two anchors because they would have no chance to introduce themselves. Punamji is an architect, building conservation consultant, researcher, and a writer. She has three decades of domestic and international experience. She's the founding director of the Goa-based award-winning studio Archineva and Verons. She is also the co-founder of Goa Heritage Action Group and serves on the first Scientific Council Steering Committee of ICOMOS India and on the Senate of SPA Vijaywada. She is the author and contributor of numerous articles and books. Her latest book is The Mapped Heritage of Panji Goa, which was published in 2018. 
Thank you, Poonamdi, for, for coming in and taking this responsibility. The other anchor is uh, Vinayak Saab. He is a practicing urban design and city planner based in Los Angeles, USA. He's adjunct associate professor of urbanism at the University of South California and co-director of the India Netherlands based knowledge platform, My Livable City. He, his works have received numerous awards, including the National Award for Smart Growth, Overall Excellence by the US Environmental Protection Agency, and the Excellence in Planning Implementation Award from the American Planning Association. He is the author and editor of numerous books. So with this brief introduction of two very brilliant people, I hand this over to Punamji and Vinayak Bhai to, to, to conduct this session. Thank you very much. Punamji. Good morning. Thank you for joining us. And thank you, Kirtiji, for extending to us this platform of in-house web series on rethinking and for inviting us to conceptualize a dialogue on heritage conservation in the emerging Indian city. To address the overarching theme, we conceived this three-part web series that could provoke discourse and debate towards generating actions and strategies for repositioning heritage in Indian cities. The focus of this series is on heritage conservation, not in the narrow sense of preserving monuments and places of historic significance, but as a much more sophisticated and impactful science of the built environment that invests in the aspects of our past to address the most pressing issues facing our future. Such issues range from looming climate crisis and colossal socioeconomic polarization to administrative murkiness and social injustice. How can heritage conservation be recast? Not as an intellectual endeavor, but as a practical investment for social and cultural upliftment. How can it help bridge the now disparate disciplines of architecture, planning, and social and environmental sciences towards bigger common goals? Today's forum seeks to discuss for the 20th century architecture in Indian cities. The next one will focus on India's world heritage cities and its foreseeable impacts. And the third shall focus on conservation regulations and policy. Let us begin. This session will straddle the apparent contradiction of UNESCO World Heritage designation versus the demolition of iconic buildings in India's recent history. For example, the Chandigarh Capital Complex, designed by Lake Corbusier, was inscribed to UNESCO World Heritage Site in 2016. The Victorian Gothic and Art Deco Ensembles of Mumbai is a collection of 19th and century Victorian New Gothic public buildings and 20th century Art Deco buildings in the four precincts which are declared UNESCO World Heritage Sites in 2018. Meanwhile, the whole of nations and the Nehru Pavilion in Delhi were demolished on 24th April 2017 amidst massive protests by the Indian and international architectural community. 2019 saw the declaration of redevelopment of Central Vista Project with more demolitions planned. And in 2020, we grappled with the planned demolition of IIM and the bus iconic ensembles designed by Louis Khan in 1970. To eco-historian Narayani Gupta, sentiments. Do we need to always destroy, to build, subsuming heritage under urban development? Or can we shape a city where icons from the past, different parts, live together happily? When discussion on establishing the parameters for India's post-colonial architectural heritage continue, 
The ensuing climate crisis and looming pandemic are shedding new light on this subject. With the building industry contributing to almost 60% of carbon emission, every existing building is of great value as carbon neutral resource. With South Asian nations accommodating a majority of world's population expected to be most affected by erratic weather conditions, sustainable development is now an urgent goal. The Constitution of India mandates each citizen's fundamental duty to save and care for its heritage. The 73rd, 74th Amendments have mandated citizens' participation in the nature's, nation's development, and yet crucial decisions about the past, present, and future of our cities remain disconnected from their residents. Can professional institutions and citizens groups come together to stop mindless and demolition and become custodians of a city of parity, developed in alignment with sustainable development goals? Is it time for India's civic society to claim back its role and participate in shaping the future of the city? What can we learn or unlearn from Chandigarh, Delhi, Ahmedabad, and Mumbai? Today, we have eight eminent thought leaders with us who shall present their views individually for about eight minutes each. A 30 minutes anchor discussion shall then follow. And we request our attendees to use Q&A box to place their query with the name of the speaker addressed to. I now hand over to Vinay to welcome and introduce our first speaker. Thank you, Gunam. I want the audience to know that one of the uh, demerits of inviting such an accomplished set of eight people is their very long, very long list of accomplishments. And the bios were enormously huge. I want you to know that we've truncated them to a quarter of the size. So I'm just going to read you know, them very quickly as the, we invite the speakers, but obviously their bios are much bigger than what we're going to say. Rinda Samaya is an architect and urban conservationist. Many of you know this name very well. She's the founder of Samaya and Kalapa Consultants in Mumbai. Her firm has won numerous awards. Most recently, the UNESCO Asia Pacific Award for Distinction for Cultural Heritage Conservation for the restoration and upgradation of the historic Louis Kahn buildings of the Indian Institute of Management, Ahmedabad. In 2012, she was the recipient of an honorary doctorate from Smith College in USA, which is Alma Mater. And in 2014, she was awarded the Indian Institute of Architects Barbara Matri Award, uh, the, the gold medal for lifetime achievement. And she was also nominated for the Arc Vision Prize. She's currently also the A.D. White Professor at large at Cornell University in the US. Brenda, thank you for coming tonight and the stage is yours. Shall I begin? Yes, please. Thank you very much. Uh, I would just like to thank Kirti and Poonam and Vinayak for this opportunity. Uh, my presentation is going to be a little bit of a personal narrative because today we have so many eminent panelists uh, who are going to talk about many things. So um, I want to say that 20th century buildings will survive only if our cities want them to. And so man, the protagonist of this space must believe in their value and have the passion and love for the city. Otherwise, uh, we are going to have a losing uh, battle ahead of us. Okay, so um, is it a full screen? Yes. So we are here, we are looking at our future through our past. And the passion has to come from loving where you are. And I am talking about Mumbai today. So it's in my bloodstream. I love her diversity, her pluralism, her festivals, and her vibrancy. I may groan about the traffic, moan about the pollution, fret about the shrinking of open space, but I can't live anywhere else in the world. So to come to Mumbai, I begin with the colonial heart. We know what is happening with the layers beginning with the Victorian Gothic Ensemble and the Oval Maidan, and now going to the Art Deco buildings in the 1920s and 30s, and now today the Coastal Road, which is following its own road, as we all very well know, with a path of destruction in some ways as well. 
So cities grow in different ways. Since this was 20th century architecture, I could not resist showing uh, what Mumbai is often talked about, uh, the Art Deco buildings, but it goes much, much beyond that. So heritage is not just about buildings. We have a rich natural, cultural, and architectural heritage in the city of Mumbai. And as Jane Jacobs said, what is it we need? We had all these things before. Pavements are disappearing. The old and new buildings need to stay. The district diversity is reducing. So all the neighborhood stores. So a lot of these issues are going when we knew that they are so important for the survival of the city and hence the survival of its architecture as well. So today, very quickly, I have broken up into three connected works, the formal, the informal, and the in-between spaces. When it comes to the formal space, this image I'm sure all of you know, but I've just taken central and colonial Mumbai and the red dots show some of the buildings that my studio has restored, both 19th century and 20th century buildings, starting with uh, the TCS house, which could have been demolished, but which we did not because of its importance as a 20th century building. So the inside had completely collapsed. We kept the facade and rebuilt and saved the embodied energy, carbon neutral, simple and important. Here is Bombay House, which was the international headquarters of Tata's. They could have gone anywhere in the world, built a new building, demolished this building, but the passion of the client is so important in, to restore and keep, and that's what we need. So we have private sector, but we also have NGOs. This was a small building in the heart of the city in Gamdevi, which was run by an NGO called Seva Southern. The money they get from renting out this hall goes for the education of the girl child. So they raised money, very, very difficult money, and they asked us to restore it. And now we did it, and now the children are using it, and the money that comes from renting out the hall goes for education. So we have the private sector, we have the NGOs, and here is the public sector. This is a building we restored in Ballad Estate in the heart of South Mumbai for a public sector company where the management has the wisdom to believe that it's not enough just to go to Bandakula complex, but stay within the historic part of the city and restore your buildings. So we have to have the public sector, the private sector, and the NGOs loving and wanting to save the buildings, 20th century or even 19th century buildings within the city of Mumbai. We all know that by 2050, we're going to have 700 million people. The Mumbai metropolitan area itself has 20.6 million people. So the informal sector, this is also 20th century architecture. How can we say it's not? Now, do we preserve this or do we destroy it? And do we give it to developers to build? That's the question that needs to be answered. In today's paper, they talked about another group of slums that are going to be demolished and given to developers. But this is architecture. How can we say it's not? It belongs to the people who have built it, who have made their opportunities and their lives over here. So to connect with this, I'm just talking about a competition we entered called the, 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 the National His, uh, Park over here, which was uh, a competition where we did not win. But unfortunately, even the winners have not been able to uh, execute it. The MMRDA just disappeared after they uh, floated this competition. But what was important was it connected the Ravi, which is 20th century architecture needs to be addressed with the Bandarkula complex, which are the glass boxes of 20th century architecture, whether you like them or not, they exist as well. So you go beyond the colonial heart of the city and you come further north in the city and you have, to, you have the river and the infrastructure, all of which forms the important city. So we had to connect from the fort, which was historic, through the Ravi, which was the informal 20th century architecture, through the mud flats, and to the Bandakula complex, which any of you who have been to Mumbai know and see the architecture that is over there. So it's all about history, community, the working landscape, connectivity, and aspirations of the people that is going to finally save what we believe in is so important. So we had a, suggested a bridge, a water edge, 
because unless you create spaces around the architecture and preserve them, whether they're plazas or open spaces or gardens, the value for that architecture will diminish in time and then will disappear. So there are many things that can be done, improving the water edge, creating bridges, and then finally talking to the people. And what do they say? They live in the Ravi, which is the informal area, and they work in the Bandra complex. And this is what is needed. This is the connectivity of our city. And how do we address these issues? Not necessarily by just demolishing things, not even demolishing the informal sector. So we know a city should be remembered for equality, for a sense of place, a sense of belonging and infrastructure. So finally, I come to the third part, which are the in-between spaces. So we have South Mumbai, where we have the formal architecture, and then we come to the informal architecture in many other parts of Mumbai, whether it is the city improvement trust area, etc. But I'm talking about the spaces, the informal spaces between the historic architecture of that we want to preserve, 19th and 20th century. So this was a project I worked with Professor Sidhu. It was just a, of interest, a pro bono project, which began as thoughts. And we called it the Mumbai Esplanade Project. We know lakhs and lakhs of people come out of these trains of the, at the two main stations, the VT station and the Churchgate station every day, and they fall out into the road. So we suggested that the three historic Maidans of Mumbai, the Azad Maidan, the Oval Maidan, and the uh, Cross Maidan could be connected. Uh, and we're creating 50 acres of additional space within the city, which would automatically protect the historic buildings around this historic and open space. And then the car, which has really caused the most demolition of our cities and our historic buildings could go underground like you have in so many European cities. We worked very hard on it. We did a lot of documentation. We showed how plazas could be created. Here you see the historic Hong Kong building, which is another 20th century building, uh, which is now almost completely covered by what all is going on there. And we suggested plazas there. We suggested another plaza in the uh, Kalagoda area. Here we don't have so many 20th century, we have a lot of 19th century buildings, but it's a very important area. We have the museums and and create spaces where people have a sense of belonging, whether they're migrant workers or whether they're old citizens of the city, they have a sense of connection. And that's why with these open spaces, the sense of connection to the buildings will also come. And, and then of course the VT, the historic station and the plaza that could be created over there very easily. We did a lot of work, a lot of detailing and finally, the church gate area, you can see the Eros building where we had restored the spire a few years ago as well. And how these areas, when pe excuse me, when people come out, they don't fall into the road. Uh, there was huge support from the people of the city. We had an exhibition in Horniman Circle. Uh, the press were uh, very, very positive towards it, but there was no political will and there was no bureaucratic will. And the reason for this was the car lobby, I think personally, was just too strong and they did not want to go underground. The car lobby needed to be on the surface everywhere. And we worked on it for two years, but did not succeed at the end uh, of getting implementing it. And that's the great pity because these are the sort of uh, situations that people work with the city. These are the uh, reasons and the projects that architects need to get involved with the city, where you have to go way beyond. For instance, the nature park, We, I'm sorry I didn't mention it, but it wasn't just me alone. It was, a, I put it on the slide, it was a group of international consultants, you can see that if you look back, uh, from people from all over the world, from uh, landscape designers, from water specialists, from bird and flower, faun, flora and fauna specialists, uh, to historians and to us as architects, to structural designers. I mean, we all have the talent. We work together in different projects. Why is it that city projects do not involve us? We tried very hard uh, with this as well. Unfortunately, it didn't work. So what I want to end with to say that the open spaces of the city 
and the informal architecture, the formal architecture as well, none of that can be saved because we are being pushed back, pushed back and pushed back. So the future, so the past to our future passes through our past and now the present is the time to act. Thank you. Thank you so much. We'll restrict ourselves from reacting just to keep time and we will have a major discussion. So we are looking forward to it and I move on to our next speaker introducing Riaz. Riaz Sayerji is a practicing architect and partner at Anthill Design, MWA, actively involved in architecture documentation, research and academics. He has been an associate professor as faculty of architecture SEPT University and the coordinator of Gandhi Heritage Sites mission set up to document the buildings made by and related to the life of MK Gandhi. He has curated exhibitions on the architecture and urbanity of Ahmedabad. Presently, he is the team lead at National Institute of Urban Affairs, working on the heritage conservation plan for the World Heritage City, Ahmedabad, following its UNESCO inscription. Over to you, Riaz. Thank you. <coughs> uh, thank you, Kirti Bhai, uh, Poonam, and uh, Vinayak for having me on this. Uh, Get louder, please. Yeah, um, uh, am I audible? Uh, better now? A little louder would be nice. Okay, just one. I'll just check my volume. Is that better? Yes. Okay. So, um, thank you for having me. I. Uh, I just want to before I uh, before I begin, I want to uh, really uh, uh, say that uh, you know how important Brinda is uh, mentioning the informal as part of architecture of the twentieth century is uh, a, a few years ago it became apparent through some of our documentation that these informal settlements uh, actually have the same underpinning uh, spatial armature that. Uh, some of the more evolved and older settlements, uh, uh, which are vernacular, uh, have as well. And I would, in this case, specifically cite the uh, the old city of Ahmedabad. Uh, that over time, as these settlements have evolved, they've refined their architecture, uh, but the the the, the structure uh, underlying these are very similar. So to to kind of posit that as uh, architecture to be looked at, I think is a very very important. But my uh, uh, my talk today is uh, really about uh, the modern architecture of Ahmedabad and the situation that we uh, face here. I just like to uh, I'd like to kind of um, uh, credit uh, Saro Shankasarya and Shubhra Rajay, friends, colleagues, collaborators, with whom many of these ideas are uh, have been formed in co in collaboration. And I, today I, I am not going to be presenting a, a PowerPoint because what I would like to really talk about are some of the ideas and premises that underpin modern architecture that in itself, in themselves create, con create the contradictions that we face. And one of them is this, uh, that, it, that we have felt and, and often stated uh, is the, the irony that, uh, you know, uh, modern architecture is being threatened by, with demolition. Uh, when the idea of displacement and demolition is so intrinsic to the birth of modern architecture itself. Uh, and whether this is in the form of uh, the demolition of older settlements, uh, a housemanization process, if you like, the appropriate <laughs> appropriation of indigenous lands for the building of new cities, uh, infrastructure development, uh, displacements of the order of the Narmada, uh, dam or resources extractions that uh, you know fire up the engines that uh, keep this modernity uh, and keep modern modernism going. And when we look at that, it raises a. Uh, I mean, it's it, it's quite ironic that we don't think that these process would come back to bite modern architecture itself. And that's really what I'm going to kind of talk about today in the case of uh, Ahmedabad. And I will uh, provocatively suggest that uh, modern heritage in Ahmedabad was born in the, <laughs> quite specifically in the second quarter of 2014. 
Uh, and uh, prior to this, it was impossible to think of buildings, or we never thought of buildings like uh, the Sanskar Kendra, the IIM, or SEPT University as heritage buildings at all. These were buildings that were part of the fabric of the city, and they evolved, uh, uh, they changed, they were added to by a number of authors. Uh, and uh, that, whoops, that in different degrees and in, with different ideas uh, added to the ensemble of these buildings, of these campuses really. And uh, in 2014, suddenly we were faced with three quite separate yet intertwined uh, incidences that were also played out in the press. And uh, sometime in April of that year, uh, we heard that a flood control tower was to be built uh, right next to the Sanskar Kendra building. There was great outdoor and uh, there was um, uh, uh, there was a change.org petition as has become uh, has become the new normal these days. Uh, there was a, a protest at the at the museum itself. Very well known architects and. Um, students and the community was out there in protest. And uh, a few months later, you had uh, rumors, which now we know to be uh, unfortunately true that the hostel buildings that the Indian Institute of Management were under threat. And I remember waking up that morning and being, I, I can't imagine what Ahmedabad would be like without those buildings. And yet this was a narrative very much amongst architects and it was being played out in the test, in the press uh, uh, amongst architects. Uh, 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 kind of with that tone that, uh, you know, how could this possibly happen? Uh, the third was, of course, the, the SEP University uh, debate, which was also extremely uh, energetically, uh, uh, you know, contested in the public uh, domain, uh, where uh, changes in uh, the idea of ideas of education, new policies to education had um, had brought about administrative changes and a new idea of what campus should be, uh, leading to uh, a reconfiguration of the of the SEPT campus. All of these, I might add, uh, changes were due to policies that had uh, their inception a couple of years earlier. And one, in retrospect, uh, is surprised that we were surprised <laughs> that uh, this had that this seemed so sudden at the time because. Urban, uh, urban changes were well underway by 2012. Uh, Ahmedabad was growing at a, at a rate that was uh, unprecedented at the, uh, till that time. Uh, a new flyover construction in, alongside the IIM had increased its possible developmental densities by more than double. Uh, the development of the riverfront in front of the Sanskar Kendra had completely changed the urban uh, context in which it found itself, and SEPT University was being uh, uh, was being looked at in the milieu of the way education was changing, professional education was changing across the country, and in some sense, all of these uh, uh, institutions were responding in the manner that they found appropriate within that milieu, uh, except perhaps Substranskar Kendra, which I will get into in some detail in a bit, but. Um, the relationship between building and the city is something that unless we are able to uh, relook at and uh, reconsider, I don't think that the, and I think Brinda has already suggested that, that we, unless the city uh, considers these buildings important, uh, we will not be able to preserve them. We will not be able, uh, preserve is not the word I want to use, but they will not, uh, they will not uh, survive. And in this case, it's really interesting to look at the case of uh, Sanskar Kendra because the other two uh, are well known uh, and the, the threats to them have been uh, kind of discussed quite uh, quite a lot of in recent time particularly. But Sanskar Kendra, though under great threat, in uh, our opinion, the, the threat is one of uh, planned negligence, <laughs> which has uh, you know kind of allowed it to deteriorate to such an incredible level that uh, its very existence is um, uh, very precarious. Uh, and yet, you know, I mean, one, one wonders uh, uh, at the time of its inception, I mean, in 1951, uh, when Corbusier was invited to actually design this building, what was the kind of uh, idea of a museum in a city like Ahmedabad of the time? Uh, at the time, Ahmedabad would have had a, 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 a population of a little bit over 300,000 people, maybe three and a half hundred thousand people. 
uh, its own very well-known uh, president of the municipal council a few decades earlier, Sardar Patel had said that it, uh, there are no cities in India, only villages. It was little more than a, a, a large village. It was networked into its own interland with a very interesting, now studied quite uh, in detail, uh, a network of other villages that uh, led, uh, that dealt with agriculture production and uh, resource uh, and craft and so on and so forth. Uh, and in this uh, large, uh, uh, largely uh, kind of uh, vernacular uh, setting, uh, were these uh, were the uh, industrial elites who uh, were importing uh, ideas of urbanity, ideas of civic uh, development, uh, which came from another culture. And in this, we must ask the question as to what was appropriate, whether the programs that were being suggested, uh, and though there was a great difference between people like Kobuzier and people like uh, the uh, Gira and Gautam Sarabha in their idea of a museum, the very, uh, the very sense uh, or, or the very idea of inserting these uh, centralized large institutions into a fabric that was largely sectionally divided. Uh, and in, and this, the, the, even in the, uh, it might be interesting for me to read out uh, the pamphlet, uh, uh, the pamphlet that was circulated at the time that, um, uh, that the Sanskar Kendra was being uh, thought up and, and being promoted. And, and it says that there is no central cultural uh, uh, institute. Uh, and though it was recognized that there were many, many small institutes and cultural centers and, uh, you know, uh, institutions within the older city of Ahmedabad, um, there was no uh, civic uh, sense to this. And the entire master plan for the, uh, for the museum was uh, being pitched uh, on an idea of the revitalization of the urban core of Ahmedabad, even though it's displaced outside it. So there are deep contradictions in the way the narrative develops uh, for justifying this uh, this um, this institution and uh, Corbusier, in fact, uh, a few months after uh, being invited, is already presenting at CM uh, this as a revitalization, urban re revitalization project, and the master plan uh, uh, is being looked at in that manner. Interestingly, when uh, the, the demolition, uh, when the, uh, not demolition in this case, but when the addition of the, the when there is the furor of the, uh, of the addition of the, um, the flood control tower that the municipality is uh, building, the, the municipal commissioner justifies the building by citing Corbusier's master plan, saying that there is a kind of grid that surrounds the existing building. So really, the, 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 there is an architectural heritage argument being proposed by the municipal commissioner in order to justify new additions. And in some sense, the circularity is there in the idea of a, 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 a museum of infinite growth. Uh, and the question is, what is the relationship between the new program and the existing program of the new museum? Yet the existing program of the museum was really very, very vague. When Mr. Uh, M. B. Kadri, who was the chairman of the Recreation and Cultural Committee of EMC at the time, invited Corbusier. He said, uh, "You will design a museum uh, for painting, sculpture, and archaeology, and it will have the usual amenities that are provided by a modern museum." That is it. And so, you know, that was the kind of idea. And though, of course, there were specifics that were discussed, that those were more to do with. Uh, you know what the what what kind of art, artifacts? There's so Riyaz, but we need to uh, if you can wrap it up. No, no, I'm just going to I'm just going to bring it to an end. So my 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 contention here is that uh, uh, in the uh, in the development of Ahmedabad, actually the context has become more receptive uh, to a museum program uh, from what it was at the time of the inception of the museum itself. And the, the riverfront development, or whether you look at the broadening of roads, uh, roads and the building of infrastructure, they have all added to that civicality that uh, supports the music. So what I would like to <laughs> leave as a pro provocation, though incomplete, is that often change and development allows for a, a program that was misrepresented at the time of its inception to find a place if we are able to um, shape uh, the uh, building 
through our repair, renovation, and reconfiguration in its maintenance to the new realities of its time. Thank you. Thank you, Riaz. Excellent talk. Uh, Annabelle Mascarenas Lopez is our next speaker. She's an architect and heritage management consultant with more than three decades of experience. She has been involved in the preparation of World Heritage Nomination dossiers, conservation management plans, and heritage impact assessments. Her professional interests range from documentation to legislation for the protection of 19th and 20th century architecture and planning. She undertakes consultancy projects for organizations like INTAC and World Monuments Fund, and is the Commerce India Coordinator of National Scientific Committee on 20th Century and an expert member of Ecomos International Scientific Committee for 20th Century Heritage. Uh, Annabelle, it's your turn. Thank you. Thank you, Vinaya. Thank you, Poonam and Kirti Ji for having me here today. It gives me great pleasure to be on this panel. And hello, everyone. Um, I will also share my screen. Go into um, yeah. Is the screen visible to everyone? Yes. Uh, it gives me great pleasure to be here today to talk to you about, about a subject that I'm quite passionate about: 20th century architecture. My own journey with 20th century uh, heritage began at Intact Delhi chapter when we were working on the notification of 62 iconic structures in Delhi. This was an exercise initiated by the then convener of Intact Delhi chapter, AJK Menon. But before we were, we made any headway with the Heritage Conservation Committee and other regulatory bodies in Delhi, the Hall of Nations was demolished until today due to the resistance from multiple agencies, not a single building on that list has been notified. But today, I am not going to present to you the many stories that of buildings that have been demolished. What I'm going to talk to you today is not another challenge that we are facing with respect to 20th century architecture, but perhaps a small ray of hope. And what I do believe is going to be a success story in the conservation of 20th century architecture, simply because the people of Ahmedabad love this building and are very passionate about it. So this is the Sadar Vallabhai Patel Stadium, located right in the heart of the densely built up city of Ahmedabad. Riyas has set the stage to uh, tell us all about the challenges that the city is facing with a lot of its uh, 20th century buildings. We all know about uh, the story of um, I am Ahmedabad, but this is slightly different. It is a story of hope, like I said. The building, um, the stadium was designed in the 1960s as a part of our nation building activities soon after independence. Uh, cricket, as you all know, was brought into the country by the British, was, but was patronized in India first by the royalty and the princely states until it became a popular sport. In Ahmedabad, however, the narrative is slightly different. Here, it was the mercantile class that were the patrons of most building activity in uh, Ahmedabad, and the stadium is one such building. It was designed by internationally acknowledged award-winning architect Charles Correa and uh, eminent structural designer Mahindra Raj. Um, Korea is probably among the top 10 internationally acknowledged regional uh, critical regionalists, and Mahindra Raj is known for his structural ingenuity. What makes this building a piece of human creative genius is, however, the synergy that was there between the architect and the engineer. Every architectural detail incorporated by the ar architect in this building displays the intervention and genius of the engineer. The outstanding feature of the building, however, it's its folded plate cantilever measuring about 21 meters. At the time that the stadium was built, it was perhaps the first time a folded plate cantilever of this scale was attempted anywhere in the world. The first one day international match ever to be played was played at this stadium. 
But what is most significant about the stadium, the reason why I have chosen this as an example to talk to you today, is the very public nature of this space. The custodians of the site, the Ahmedabad Hospital Corporation, allow free access to this building. And today the site at any point of time in the day is thronging with people from all over the city. There are morning walkers, joggers, yoga enthusiasts, and of course, young athletes who are and aspiring cricketers attending the numerous cricketing training camps on the grounds. There is no doubt that this building built in the 1960s is under a lot of stress. The concrete has deteriorated and is in need of conservation. The custodians of the site, the Ahmedabad Municipal Corporation have recognized this. Efforts have been made in the past too to conserve this building and uh, again, the focus of the exercise here is to conserve concrete, but, but we're also looking at, at this as a space that will bring back an important green area to the citizens of Ahmedabad. To start with, the site was put on the World Mon Monuments Watch list in 2020 to draw global attention to the issue, and it subsequently received a grant, the Keeping It Modern Initiative, uh, by the Getty Foundation. It is indeed commendable that both the World Monuments Fund and the Getty Foundation have the vision to select this project, which is a very public site as the recipient of both this global attention as well as funding. The conservation management plan that is currently being prepared has reached out to multiple stakeholders in order to create a constituency of supporters. And this perhaps is the key most important thing that is, is being done for this site in addition to, of course, the conservation of concrete. A number of activities to articulate the significance of the stadium have already been initiated. Recording oral histories of the people who are associated with the space was one of the first steps in this exercise. The expressions from the cricketing community and the daily users of the stadium have been recorded. And it is indeed heartwarming to hear about their close associations with this site. Here we have the, a former cricket uh, player and empire who talks about the cantilevered slab and how it was possible for viewers to watch matches without any Collins for sport. So not a technical person, not an architect, but he still appreciated the design of the stadium. Um, others talk about how the, they love the stadium and they still feel very connected with a building built 60 years ago. And daily users of the site talk about how the ground is really a temple for them. I don't go to a temple, but I make sure that I come here every day. So this is simply to showcase to you that yes, people do care for their city, but as architects, it is important for us to create this constituency of people who care. Um, another part of this uh, initiative was a virtual campaign sorry, launched to- So sorry to do this, if you can wrap it up, please. So to, uh, a campaign to get people's uh, ideas about the stadium and um, the original contractors of the stadium was also con uh, contacted who lent their, their support. The challenges with the concrete are, uh, of uh, conserving concrete are of course daunting, but the task is not insurmountable. Um, while the changes in the building regulation and city level policies are important. What is also important is to involve people in caring for their cities. They may seem like small steps, but, but um, every little step counts. And to learn from Jane Jacob, um, who was able to convince decision makers that acting locally is as critical as drawing large ambition plans for the city. And as I was putting these visions together this morning, I also got to hear of another success story, the Kala Academy in Goa. The court has confirmed that the building will not be demolished. So yes, people initiatives do count and every step counts. My mess simple message is create a constituency of people who care. After all, every building is a carbon neutral resource. 
Thank you. Thanks for, uh, for bringing us a, a sense of hope through your presentation, Annabel. I now invite, um, if you can stop sharing your screen, uh, Annabel. Thank you. I invite our next speaker, well known to all of us, Mr. KT Tabinde. He's an urban designer practicing from Delhi. He is a member of Governing Council, Chairman of Architecture and Heritage Advisory Committee, and Convener Delhi Chapter of Impact. He is a trustee of the Madhavan Nair Foundation Kochi. He was a member of Advisory Board for the United Nations Capital Master Plan New York. He was also Dean and Senior Academic Advisor for Rick's School of Goods Environment. He is a former Chairman of Delhi Urban Arts Initiative and was the founding president of the Institute of Urban Designers, India. Welcome, Katie. Over to you. You're, you're on mute. Ah, thank you, Poonam. I'll start sharing my screen. A little louder will help. Slightly louder, please. All right. I'm just turning on the screen. Yeah. All right, so uh, I'll very quickly go through uh, a few points uh, that I'd like to raise, so issues that I'd like to raise. Some of them have already been raised by the previous speakers, uh, but I would like to pause it in a different mode. Uh, basically to look at uh, uh, what we have defined as 20th century architecture is, uh, seems to be not really 20th century architecture. It's largely about uh, post independence architecture, at least the way it is moving. And uh, it's also largely also about uh, uh, the iconic modern architecture that we have in our cities. So uh, what I'd like to do is to actually uh, posit some inherent contradictions or inherent dichotomous trends that we see in our cities and the manner in which they're growing and I'll make those points through uh, a few specific uh, issues. Uh, here, uh, I'm talking about that, uh, I'm talking about the point that cities are more than the sum total of its iconic buildings. In other words, a few iconic buildings don't make the city. So when we call something as 20th century architecture, everything that's built in the city qualifies to be 20th century, not merely the modernist buildings that we see. Now the modernist buildings that we see is actually uh, things which stick out and they have a certain role to play in the urban structure, in the visual structure of the city. They have a very important role to play. I am not by any means trying to diminish their importance. For instance, uh, uh, Korea's uh, tower that you see here is, I, I think that it's still one of the most beautiful tall buildings designed anywhere in the world. It's certainly an outstanding piece of architecture. But my point is that that doesn't really make the city. There are more things to the city than just iconic buildings. So as an urban designer, I would like to look at the city. I mean, uh, one can actually, for convenience or, uh, or you can even say for provocation, one can define it as a binary of looking at the city from the monument or looking at the city from the marketplace. So between the monument and the marketplace, our gaze is, our, our, when I say our gaze, I mean, we professional architects, and planners and urban designers, our gaze is squarely focused on the monument. And we are looking at the city from the monument. 
I'd like to reverse that gaze and look at the city from the marketplace. So in India, there are two, uh, like, uh, two completely opposite trends simultaneously taking place. One is there is a huge thrust of what Rahul Merotra had called the impatient capital, which is creating large icons, clearing up places, creating new, 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 new icons uh, of modernism and international trends. On the other hand, there is a groundswell of something like the Arab Spring. There's an urban spring that's happening in the Indian cities where people are protesting against master plans. People are protesting against you know, high-handed, uh, uh, top-down type of approach to planning. And they're also creating, a, uh, they're wanting to reclaim the street to themselves. So there are these two dichotomous trends taking place simultaneously in the Indian city. And we need to view 20th century architecture from both these perspectives. Now, the historic processes also give rise to neighborhoods which display collective values of people. This is a very important point to note is that there are collective values of people which results in the collective expression of the urban form. Now, the best example in Mumbai, to take Mumbai as we are talking about uh, the Panchanjiga building, is to look at, uh, for instance, the role that uh, the Chauls in played in the formation of Mumbai, its psyche, and its final, uh, final character as an area of great capital accumulation. If you look at how the Chauls came about, the Chauls were made as part of an industrial development, which was very much a 20th century phenomenon. The Chauls are very much a 20th century phenomenon. They were uh, kind of multi-family dwellings with very poor infrastructure and facilities, but with a large open space in front of it and secured employment in the mills. So between the employment center and the uh, and, uh, residents, that is the Chawl, they developed a whole system of markets and open spaces, which finally becomes an urban subsystem. You know, this urban subsystem is a very 20th century product. And this subsystem is, in fact, a great area of learning. And if you have to talk about future of cities, we need to look at that. Huh? Look at how uh, these things need to be protected and enhanced if we have to actually protect the 20th century heritage of cities. Now, if you take the example of Chandigarh, a similar parallel, where the housing done by Jane Doe and Maxwell Fry are as significant as the iconic capital bomb but they're not protected. Only the iconic capital complex has been identified as world heritage. And the, the entire housing that has actually been so successful in places like sector 22 and 21 have not been identified as important uh, urban artifacts. It's not only the, the physical built form of these areas which matter, but it's also the manner in which people have adapted and created their own networks inside, cross-cutting the sectors, cross-cutting the sectoral divisions, and creating contiguous markets, and creating an environment of convivality, which actually embodies the true spirit of Chandigarh. So there is there's something for us to look at there. You know? It's an example of uh, the uh, industrial icons that were created at that time in the 50s and how they gave rise to an architecture. I will not discuss this in detail. Now we move to the issue of modernism's obsession with the individuated icons of design. And that is a direct result of the capitalist discourse that shaped the 20th century. Now, modernism, just like very much like in the large part of modern art also, is a child of capitalist economic uh, thrusts. You know? The impatient capital has rushed into our cities and created these uh, large icons. Uh, and we as a community are in fact obsessed with that. 
and we are not looking at the processes of economic process which actually give rise to the capital formation of cities and our failure to protect the whole of nations which uh, uh, just now uh, has been brought out as an example and even our failure to protect the central vista in delhi betray the marginalization of our stylistic discourses in the real politic of development here you have an image of uh, one of the bhavans uh, with nehru in the back in the foreground nehru is letting a bird fly into the sky uh, looking at the soaring democratic process etc and both these areas are being brought under demolition now yeah? and the discourse that we have is about environment about uh, architectural history about uh, heritage about public spaces but these are non dialogues for the people who are actually moving the bulldozers the people for the people who are moving the bulldozers this is a political attempt to politically reconstruct icons which will represent a completely different ideology and only by demolishing the old ideology and demolishing the icons of old ideology can this new political statement be made and we are not addressing that as a political issue we are addressing it stylistically from conservation and environment and legal frameworks and so on they are also equally important i am not saying that they are not important i am simply positing a dichotomous situation there are many shades of gray between these two points of, uh, of the economy but that's for us to think and ideate now the city is also the result of multiple political negotiations urban design demands a discourse in deeper more local political histories rather than in an internationalized vacuous discourse on modernism or what is called regionalism yeah regionalism for instance says assumes that there is a center and a periphery yeah that there there are center or core areas and the regions yeah? and we all fall in that region okay so it's no one's guess to see who who is at the, in the center yeah so for heaven's sake wherever you are standing in this universe that is your center but here somebody has put us into the regional frame and it's called it critical regionalism and we fall very easy prey to that discourse you know and that is the kind of discourse which is actually guiding our entire discourse on cities you know? but in the pandemic all these icons were empty you know during the pandemic and the lockdown even now many of them are empty they are abandoned by users and is there a lesson there in that's the question you know? because uh, what we see in these icons is that they are great masterpieces of art architecture high thing high culture and so on but at the same time when it comes to an extreme crisis a life threatening crisis where do people go people run back home what they call home they are willing to walk thousands of kilometers to reach home because home is the point of security home is where you nurture your life so that is perhaps fundamentally the most important contribution of 20th century architecture is that we have created diverse concepts of homes and this entire gamut of diversity of homes should be part of our discourse as much as this uh, the the very seductive attractive and wonderful buildings which we call the icons of 20th century now the future of 20th century architecture is different from that of the future of cities that's a question i leave you with the image you see is from delhi this is the second lockout period the first one was much worse than this this is at least a little more organized people are standing in queues and some of them are wearing masks and so on but the first one was a complete other and we know that that first lockdown and the subsequent out migration that we saw from cities was the major cause 
of being a super spreader. Yeah? But even in the second lockdown, where many lessons were learned, at least the central government learned to stay out of the controversy by saying, what lockdown? I'm, we are not saying any lockdown. Yeah? So it was all onus was on the state governments as well. Anyway, the political process is something else. And what we manifest, what is manifest to us as urban designers, urban planners, and architects is that our cities have been woefully inadequate in providing fundamental security and shelter to thousands of families who actually produce our cities. And this is not, I'm not talking about any history. This is the current present scenario. Yeah? So when you look at history, what do, why do we look at history? We look at it because it helps us uh, formulate uh, our next step in the current time, the, in the here and now. You know? So it's the processes of the here and now that should reveal to us inversely the processes of history. You know? So it, it's a continuous iterative process of excavation of facts from time, as well as formulation of action in the future. So when, it, when one sees the city from that perspective, it's important to see that we, we define 20th century uh, architecture from a much larger gamut, as I said in the beginning, from the marketplace rather than from the monument. Thank you, Puna. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Katie. That was a brilliant provocation. Uh, Sangeeta Bhaga Mehta is our next speaker. She's a professor at the Chandigarh College of Architecture and also the first woman principal of the college. She was coordinator of the National Scientific Committee on 20th Century Heritage of the Commerce India from 2017 to 2020. She was the formal nodal officer for the UNESCO World Heritage nomination of the Chandigarh Capital Complex. She's currently an expert member of the Ecommerce International Scientific Committee on 20th Century Heritage. She recently completed a residency on the work of Pierre Genéret at the Canadian Centre of Architecture in Montreal. And she leads the institutional consultancy in the Chandigarh College of Architecture since 2017. Uh, and among others, the, that, that team prepared the State of Conservation Report for the UNESCO World Heritage Site Capital Complex in Chandigarh. Sangeeta, great to see you again. And the stage is yours. Thank you, Vinayak. Uh, it's an honor to be here amongst former teachers, my colleagues, and uh, uh, I mean, I, I'm at a loss of words because once Katie has spoken, it's difficult to for a student to take the floor. Nevertheless, um, I'll begin by sharing my screen. Can you see my screen? Yes. Excuse me. Uh, right, yeah. right. So um, my role today here is a little different. We had this conversation between Punam and myself, and uh, the idea began with what would be the role of academia? when it comes to conserving or uh, care, taking care of 20th century heritage in especially a modern city like Chandigarh, which has recently risen to fame, acclaim, and has come into the notion of world heritage. So uh, when one talks about an academia, we really are vehicles for dissemination of knowledge. And that knowledge in the 20th century has to be very carefully portioned and very carefully sought out because one, we are instilling a sense of pride of place in the students, but as a seed of passive learning, the city is also undergoing change on a daily basis. And we are experiencing change as we negotiate this city. And it offers an opportunity for research on city parks but then how much and how well we are able to impart that to the students is really the challenge for academia today. 
uh, the recent uh, transporter serial status to the World Heritage uh, uh, UNESCO nomination of the architectural works of Le Corbusier as a transporter serial nomination brought in through the French quarter has risen a lot of, uh, you could say, dilemmas, questions as to what really is the heritage of Chandigarh. Is it the iconic or is it the ordinary? The everyday architecture of Chandigarh, which Katie mentioned, the neighborhoods, the work of Jane Drew, Maxwell Fry, and Pierre Jean Rene, who stayed in the city for numerous years to actually construct the fabric of the neighborhoods that we use through in and day out. Is it important or is the iconic important? And though we say it's the heritage of humanity, it's the heritage for all, but how true is that in daily life? That is the question that we need to pose about. The recognition of everyday architecture has also enlarged the uh, envelope of conservation in Chandigarh, and we have actually started looking at other buildings beyond the Capitol complex. For example, tiny buildings like the Gandhi Bhavan and another project by Corbusier based on what Riaz mentioned, the Museum of Unlimited Growth. The second project, the Museum of Unlimited Growth, gets a Getty Grant project, and we are currently we've completed with a conservation management plan. And there are some active uh, projects which are being taken up by the Getty on this very building. So it really serves as that seed or that embryo where academia can have an interface with what is happening on site. And that is especially important in today's world where teaching learning happens outside the classroom rather than within the confines of the schools. Which also takes us to investigations which are cross, across borders and whereby this whole idea of international workshops takes place. So Chandigarh has also been a labyrinth where there is international discourse and there is an exchange of ideas. So we get to see the city at various lengths the lens, which is the view from inside, and then the view, which is from outside. And then we interpolate the two to see which view is what the city should head for. So that provides an opportunity to students, both national and international, to bring in this discourse. The values and meanings, you know, how do we document the change versus the continuity? So while definitely everybody knows and we are very clear about that without change, there cannot be continuity. So the discourse further goes on to understand the values, the meanings of conservation and how much do we value the present to take it to the future and what would be the limits of acceptable change? Because for any living city and Chandigarh, even its uh, iconic modern heritage of the UNESCO World Heritage, the capital, it's a living heritage. It's an office building, it's a judiciary, it's the high courts, and you have the executive powers there. So all these buildings are part of the living city. And we cannot say that we could fossilize or we could just completely you know, stop any kind of development there because we have to keep them active. After all, buildings are resources, they cost money. Further to this comes the reversible and the a question which is oft discussed in the studios. What is interpretive? What is readable? Can we distinguish between the inherent and the intrinsic? So what are the values that we as uh, academicians can impart or even discuss in the studios and bring about a change in the thinking of the minds? Which also brings me to a very important part lessons that one can learn from cities like Chandigarh. Chandigarh is, we all know, it's an east-west exchange. However hard it might be, but investigations into the city have actually revealed that it is a testimony to an east-west dialogue, a city which was built on the dictates of climate, six seasons, a shoestring budget, and a paucity, near paucity, or a near vacuum of indigenous expertise and only use was local men, materials and methods of construction. So climate played such a major role and however difficult we may 
find it to admit chandigarh's architecture is addressing the climate it addresses the materials and to bring in chandigarh has utilitarian architecture the buildings actually breathe and it is because of the use of local stone brick and materials of construction of course concrete is a modern material that was brought in but if you look at really the everyday architecture of the city it is that pierre jean rey's work which really gives and breathes the vision of gandhi in the city so the art in everyday architecture is another fundamental part of the city and one finds that the utility is not art for the sake of being a piece of sculpture but art which is utilitarian and then becomes the beauty or the manifesto of beauty in a modern city so we can see numerous places and functions of this art so the design of chandigarh is not just the design of the buildings it was a total design of even the interiors as to how the buildings would be actually filled in through furniture artifacts uh, display items through lighting fixtures and also through the use of the best which could be made out of what was not used for any and to this i come to my nearly last slide where i want to portray that during the pandemic this was one city that survived the pandemic so beautifully we left of us the cars away we realized that there were empty areas in the city center the sub city center whereby we could still give sufficient office and retail space we did studies about that we could reduce travel time and we could minimize social desert effects of the city center the green cover of course chandigarh has a brilliant green cover but even magnified and the abundance of fruits and vegetables and the abundance and variety of bird and animal life it came and gave us we have new, numerous videos which we were sharing all through the pandemic of how the wildlife from behind the sukhna lake actually came on and appropriate the janmar which is a processional path to the capital and the final lesson that we learned and our students taught us was that reduction in demand and lifestyles we could make do with what's at home students were actually i'm happy to share students did not do much of drawing work or much of work on the computers instead they utilized the time to make models of things which were available at home because of, during the lockdown nobody could move out so that is a very intrinsic lesson that chandigarh and we have learned and we are very proud of this fact thank you so much thank you sangeeta our next speaker is susan mcdonald from los angeles uh, the irony here is though we don't we're not that far from each other in los angeles i'm meeting susan for the first time here susan is head of buildings and sites at the getty conservation institute where she oversees over 20 projects that aim to advance conservation practice internationally involving research field projects training and dissemination susan has worked as a conservation architect in private practice in australia and in england and also in the public sector where she was involved in conservation issues at the strategic and the bottom up level she is a member of docomomo international on the specialist technical committee and a vice president of the e-commerce 20th century committee she has written numerous publications on the conservation of modern heritage and concrete conservation thank you susan it's all yours hi good morning everybody um i'm absolutely delighted uh to be here thank you so much for uh inviting me to be part of this discussion with this incredible uh group of colleagues i feel very humbled by it um and i really enjoyed listening to this discussion um uh despite my specific um knowledge on this on this topic and this work in india um i have a great interest in i mean and am completely in awe of the depth and breadth of um modern heritage in india uh which i think is um so inspiring and exciting and i also wanted to say that i've been really appreciative of 
um, and I'm particularly interested in um, the energy and commitment relating to the conservation of modern heritage that is coming out of India right now as part of this international debate. Uh, I know these things are not always easy and there have been disappointments, but there are also, as we've heard, uh, many successes. Um, I'm trouble with my slide progression. So in many parts of the world, 20th century heritage is besieged and we're really struggling to gain recognition for it and to successfully conserve it. Um, there has been a lot of really high profile losses over the past few decades and these continue on a regular basis. Um, these examples that I've shown on the screen here are from the US, from India, from Singapore, the UK and Australia and were all battles that were hard fought by the conservation community and subject to varying degrees of public protest as well. Um, Sometimes the reasons stated for demolition have been the lack of fitness for purpose, uh, sometimes technical challenges of the culprit, but in reality it's usually driven by the potential for economically advantageous redevelopment and the fact that such heritage is really stopped, not still well valued. For the serious building in, in Sydney shown on the left here, um, this was the driver for this was really about government reducing its public asset responsibility and adding dollars to its coffers through the redevelopment of the site, public housing site to, to um, luxury housing. Um, other sites languished through lack of care. Cardross Seminary in Scotland down on the bottom right here um, is a case where obsolescence of use and its isolated location have led to long-term neglect and an uncertain future. And now the large costs required for for rehabilitation. And then the Sanskar Kendra, which has already been spoken about today, suffers from a lack of stewardship and, um, and poor past repairs. Yeah. Um, so these are some of the typically cited challenges for modern heritage that have relevance in many parts of the world, uh, and particularly for post-war uh, or for, for um, post-independence. Um, heritage in India, this question of the lack of appreciation, recognition and protection. Uh, and I, I do know that there is a, a specific barrier to uh, the legislation in India for things to be nationally listed, which is a barrier for that. Um, but, you know, I know that there are local governments who are stepping up to the plate. Um, there's also this incredibly large scale of urban structures that characterise um, this post-independence era and the history of what these places have replaced. Um, there is also a lot of, um, in, in many parts of the world, there's a lot of this uh, built environment, which makes it hard for people to understand why it might be important. It's not yet rare. There are also perceived challenges of functional obsolescence and challenges of adaptation. Um, there are specific technical challenges, the question of durability and lifespan of, of, of materials like concrete the perceived extra costs associated with their conservation, the fact that we're still learning how to deal with these technical challenges. And so we have certain knowledge gaps and lack of information and skills to, to know how to actually conserve it. But I would say that these are all pretty much challenges that have been leveled at heritage of any era and ones that we've now been grappling with for at least 25 years and which there's a growing body of information about how these can be overcome. But I think there's one other factor that's worth noting in some places that these buildings hail from an era of huge government investment um, and sometimes local um, patronage and the current downturn in trends in government ownership and patterns of patronage for modern architecture have actually changed. Um, the privatisation of services by government means that they're often selling off these assets, which has implications um, for this heritage. So um, as... Um, has been um, posed, I think there are an increasing number of World Heritage Sites from the 20th century. And, but I don't think these are the sites that are really challenging us. They're probably all going to be fine. They're well recognised and to varying degrees, they have access to the skills and resources that are available to conserve them. But what about the bulk of our, our 20th century heritage? Um, and I think as others have said, um, and as KG Ravindran said, you know, what about the urban, sub urban substructure? Or I was thinking about it as the um, bread and butter that supports the jam of these icons um, and um, 
is so essential to the context of the, the, the more iconic buildings. And others have also said, I mean, a city like Shandigar, I think is such an interesting point in case. You know, the capital complex is a small, but really important part of an extraordinary modern urban landscape that exemplifies significance in planning, uh, social aspects, um, people's connection to place. And I thought it was really interesting. I checked online this morning that once again, the city seems to have been ranked the happiest city in India due to its high standards of living, its urban environment, and really importantly, people's strong connection to their city. So, um, you know, there is a very well now known and now overused adage, I think of the greenest building is the one that's already, um, already there, but it is one that I think has relevance to this subject of, um, particularly given the increasing evidence of the environmental impact of rebuilding at the scale of many of these large modern mega structures or urban areas and infrastructure that exists around the world, um, particularly um, those of concrete, which you all know is now is so environmentally impactful uh, to replace in many parts of the world, uh, the, 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 the built environment from the second half of the 20th century is uh, the bulk of um, the built environment. So we haven't yet really understood what the real financial, environmental or the social costs of the high profile demolitions of these very large scale sites um, are. And, and when we be better able to understand these, I think inevitably um, demolition of these major sites and urban areas without extremely good reasons will be increasingly seen as problematic. So the increasing use of, of tools, environmental modeling tools, the economic tools, and the people-centered approach that um, was just spoken about, um, are really gonna push us to finally adequately factor the other environmental and social and cultural costs into decision-making in a more qualitative and quantitative way. So heritage conservation, I think, um, often plays out in this sort of battleground where the predominant economic model of infinite growth and its tool development is in actually direct conflict with our planet's finite resources. And sustainable development is always cast as the panacea for somehow navigating these two opposing and irreconcilable forces. But I think it's really important and increasingly um, recognised by our sector that we need to be part of the solution and not part of the problem. And that our conservation work today needs to be reconciled with appropriate environmental responses and contribute to sustainable development goals, including um, social um, needs. So this means our toolkit needs to expand to manage change in ways that, that conserves what's important about the place, observes these greater societal needs and additional societal needs, manages the knowledge and the skills and the money that might be available to, to deal with these issues. So that means that we need to be using the full range of options for dealing with our 20th century heritage, everything from recycling to repurposing and reuse to renewing and sometimes even conserving. And so very quickly, these four images, the top uh, right is a site in Korea, which is an example of a new building using recycled concrete. The one on the top left is Park Hill Flats in Sheffield, a large urban uh, housing estate, which was reused and repurposed. The, the bottom um, right slide uh, photo shows renewal, which is showing a large scale example from Toronto, um, which is increasingly uh, proposed as an option that tackles a multitude of societal values and sometimes traditional conservation, which is the example shown on the left here, is the solution, is, as is the case, and the approach that's um, shown for the Barbican in London. So all of these options need to be on the table based on what's appropriate in each case. But we also, I think, need to make sure that we don't get these mixed up. They're different solutions for different cases, and conservation is one of the options um, out, of, out of this sort of package. So um, we have already been through this process of generating recognition for and conservation of places from the early, early 19, from the, the early and the late 19th century, Victorian era, early modern places, which are all fairly well now accepted as being worthy of conservation. But as this cycle of heritage being beleaguered and besieged moves through time, it's the heritage of the, the later 20th century that's really challenging us now. But I think there is growing and emerging evidence to suggest why we should be conserving it and growing interest and ability to know how to do that. So thank you very much. And um, thank you so much again for inviting me to be part of tonight.
Thank you so much for also keeping time and taking our time. And we move on to our next speaker. Arun Menon is Associate Professor of Structural Engineering at IIT Madras and is an architect with a doctorate in Earthquake Engineering from the University of Pavia, Italy. His research is in stress are in structural aspects of historical constructions, earthquake behavior of historical masonry, earthquake risk assessments, and earthquake resistance structural masonry. He currently coordinates activities of National Center for Sa Safety of Heritage Structures, a Ministry of Human Resource Development supported research center at IIT Madras. He's a member of expert advisory group to the International Conservation Committee of Watpo UNESCO World Heritage Site in Lao People's Democratic Republic. He has been involved in several conservation projects in India, such as Rashtrapati Bhavan, IIT Ahmedabad, IIM Ahmedabad, Minakshi Temple Madurai, Thango Monastery, Wangtu Kodrong Jong in Bhutan, UNESCO World Heritage Site of Bagan, Myanmar, and San Sebastian Basilica at Manila in Philippines. Thank you, Arun, and please over to you. Thank you, Poonam. I hope uh, I'm audible and uh, you can see my slides. Yes. And sorry Thank about you. those tongue twisters from Bhutan. <laughs> I did practice, but I think I got one or two wrong. Sorry, sorry. about that. A very good morning to one and all. At the outset, my heartfelt thanks to INHAF, Kirti Shah, Poonam Verma Mascarenas, and Vinay Badne for this invite to share space with illustrious panelists. Considering the lineup of panelists this morning, it's almost proverbial that engineers are or seem to be having the last word, with me and Alpa Sheth who will be speaking after me. When it comes to building infrastructure, the debt certificate is often signed off by structural engineers with the Democles sword of structural safety and the words, the building has outlived its useful life. The period after the industrial revolution saw rapid changes and a lot of experimentation with new materials in the art of building. Combining tensile resisting materials with compression resisting materials being one of the most important. Interestingly, ancient Indian treatises did not consider mixed materials as being rather durable. The use of cast iron was one of them. A material with poor tensile strength, highly brittle with about 2.5% of carbon making any repair a nightmare. Reinforced concrete is another such example. At the buildings at IIM Ahmedabad, when the, uh, where the letters between the structural engineer, Sharad Shah and Dui Khan, record the dilemma of wanting to use brick, but having to reinforce it using steel for earthquake safety. The repair of embedded steel in mortar joints of a porous material like brick in possibly water with significant salt content has been a real challenge to repair. The reinforced lime concrete sunshades running to over a kilometer in Rashtrapati Bhavan, designed by Edwin Latians, again, the study has been a revelation. These were meant to be executed in sandstone but finally were completed by the Public Works Department experimenting line with steel reinforcement. Again, a very tough combination. These problems apart, each of these marvels in the 19th and the 20th century, in the early days of our nation are remarkable examples of architecture and engineering, design, and execution. At IIM Ahmedabad, the attention to earthquake-resistant design from form 
to structural design and detailing in the 1960s of India are startling examples of seismic engineering in an era when computer aided design and analysis was still unheard of. The intangible knowledge will live on. Personal experiences count. My grandfather, PG Nambiar's memoirs shed light on the ground challenges to come up with high strength concrete in 1953 with unskilled labor for one of the priestess concrete girder bridges, one of the first priestess concrete girder bridges in India across the Kularun River in Tamil Nadu using the Fresne system of pre-stressing. The bridge is in service. Of course, the bridge does have a design life and may move on. But we humbly stand on the shoulder of giants as beneficiaries of this intangible heritage. In closing, we citizens and professionals must consciously extend the useful life of all built infrastructure as encapsulated by the Sustainable Development Goals 2030 of UN. Reduce, reuse, and recycle, lest we forget we have a greater treasure and legacy to preserve. Thank you. Thank you so much, Anun. It was a very different perspective, a good one. Um, now reach our last speaker, Alpa Sait, structural engineer, managing director of VMS Consultants, and the founding and managing trustee of the Structural Engineering Forum of India. She has served as a consultant and seismic advisor to the Gujarat State Disaster Management Authority, as a disaster management consultant to the state of Maharashtra, and also participated in numerous World Bank funded capacity building and disaster risk reduction projects. She is a member of the drafting group of numerous Bureau of Indian Standard Codes and chairs currently the BIS Tall Building Subcommittee. She has been the chairperson of the Academic Council of the Kamla Rahija Institute of Architecture and Environmental Studies in Mumbai for 12 years. Uh, Alpa, welcome, and the uh, stage is yours. Your audio, uh, you're on Yeah, thank you. Thank you for having me. Um, thanks so much, Poonam, Kirtibai, Vinayak, and the Habitat Forum. I'd like to start with the 15th century folk poem. The law locks up the man or woman who steers the goose from off the common, but leaves the greater villain loose who steals the common from off the goose. I'm thinking about a river when I say this, the one that we lost to the Sabarmati Riverfront Development Project, the project which turned the river into a canal. I would have loved to hear louder protests against the commissioning of that travesty. Rivers, mountains, forests, seas, they are the timeless heritage that do not belong to us. And we have but a conditional lease for its use. The condition being that we do not tamper with it, nor we leave our indelible footprint on it. But here we are reclaiming rivers and seas, cutting through hills and forests. At that time, I was residing partly in Ahmedabad and would watch in horror from my balcony on the riverfront as over what half a million cubic meters of concrete was being poured into the riverbed to make the diaphragm wall, the aprons and whatever else. Another 11 cubic meters of soil was being dumped to reclaim the river for the promenade. The citizens of Ahmedabad, for most part, were watching this with glee and pride. And the latest buzz uh, since the beginning of this month is that buildings with a height of 92 meters, uh, that I think is roughly around 22 stories above the ground, are going to come up on the Western Reclaimed Bank. I'm assuming most Ahmedabadis are happy with this as I haven't as yet heard too much grumbling. So it seems to me that we let loose the greater villain, that is the Sabarmati Riverfront Development Project, which has not even been designed for a 50-year flat level. And we are very concerned with the little geese like Khan's IM and the Bath Building, so for them, or for that matter, Corbusier's uh, architecture in Chandigarh. Any base material that is man-made appears, based on empirical evidence, to have a finite time span. And this is especially true for reinforced concrete 
that by a regimen of maintenance, you can extend its life. Uh, the first uh, multi-story building in concrete, uh, the, tall, uh, the, the tall buildings, uh, was first built in Cincinnati in uh, 1903. I think it's called the Ingalls Building, and it is still in use as of date. So that's a good case in point for good maintenance, extending the life of such buildings. But if you have neglected the building and if the cost of conserving, retrofitting and wh whatever else is going to be prohibitive, you are putting a patient on a ventilator who has not had a chance to sign a DNR, a do not resuscitate request. Or it becomes a ship of Theseus conundrum. As I said earlier, I, still, I see this happening in the Watson Hotel in um, Mumbai. I think we need to appreciate the very Japanese concept of wabi-sabi. Uh, I think if uh, any of you read Nico Ayer's books, you know, that's a constant lead motive in his books. Uh, I don't think it has a direct translation in English, but uh, it's both an aesthetic and a worldview, and it connotes a way of living that accepts the natural cycle of growth and decay. The amount of money needed to fix existing infrastructure in the United States nearly all of which is concrete in one way or another, stands at roughly $6 trillion. That is six into 10 raised to $12, uh, according to a report which has been put out by the American Society of Civil Engineers. That number does not include homes, offices, or other private buildings. It's just the infrastructure. This I'm just kind of sharing with you to underline some of the issues of concrete. And I'm talking about this because a lot of the 20th century construction in India post-independence is in concrete. The brutalist architecture of Corbusier um, and others has inspired a generation or two of homegrown architects, especially in Ahmedabad, Delhi, and Chandigarh. And I think its influence still continues to spawn architecture of that genre, and this style has also inspired infra uh, projects like the Sabramati River Front. For someone who works intimately day in and day out with this material, all I see is the heat and dust during construction and during use. Not to mention that one ton of carbon dioxide is produced for every two tons of concrete that we produce. Why do we continue to use it? Well, we continue to use it because it has its uses. But I will stop short of glorifying pieces of work done with a colossal use of the material. So you see, it's all relative. I think all architecture is political. You see that in the colonial architecture, followed with the architecture of the Nehru era. And now we are seeing an emergence of a very different kind of architecture to reflect the aspirations of the current political regime. But we have seen this across continents. You've seen it in Europe, in Central Asia, in North Africa. Architecture was raised and replaced with changing regimes. We will have to accept that every re regime has aspirations and the right to stamp its own place in history else we will be accused of espousing a cancel culture. The only true heritage in my opinion, which is timeless, and to me that is which is before us and which we do not make any effort to conserve is nature. Ironically, we are continuing to destroy it. We are not able to question the big ticket projects enough, whether it be the coastal road in Mumbai and what it does to the Queen's necklace, which is surely Mumbai's heritage but we worry about the decrepit Watson Hotel. Let's not be too self-indulgent and live in our echo chambers and mourn the loss of buildings whose best before date has long passed gone. Every generation has the right to forge its own narrative, its own aesthetic and its own preferences. I'm not sure if three generations hence, if the world still exists as we know it, people will not be questioning our aesthetics and taste for such chunky heavy structures as built in the 20th century or for that matter, if they will have any patience for the mawkish sentimental, uh, sentimentalism for the old simply because it is old. In closing, I would like to loop back to where I started. We have destroyed so much of what matters that it's really quite inconsequential to worry about the insignificant. To paraphrase from a quote attributed to Chief Seattle, what will happen when the view of the ripe hills is blotted with talking wires? Where will the thicket be? Gone. Where will the eagle be? Gone. The end of living and the beginning of survival. Thank you very much. Thank you, Abra. 
All right, we now have the difficult task of bringing all these people together. And I think I'm going to, I had a plan for three or four questions, but I think the discussions have been so provocative that it doesn't make sense to broaden this. I think there's so many brilliant points, uh, five pages of notes here. So I think what I'll do is I'll eventually bring them together at the end. But I have one question for each of you. I'd love for you to, because all of you focused on so many important points. So I'd love for you to focus on some points that stood out for me and elaborate on them a little bit. And the sort of meta question that I want to pose is, uh, I think there's been a lot of rhetoric about the, the issues and the identification of the dilemmas of how complex the rubric of conservation is in a society as complex as India. So rather than getting more into it, uh, I think it's time for speculations and perhaps sort of gestures towards uh, plausible uh, pointers, not answers, but pointers. And so I'll, I'll start with Brinda, who, who had some wonderful things about informality, uh, you know, the, the sort of nexus between formal and formal, et cetera. But the one thing that stood out for me, which is the question I want to ask Brinda is, Brinda, your project about open space immediately begins to suggest something extraordinarily wonderful, which is that open space can become a catalyst as the starting point for conservation agencies and conservation projects. Rather than thinking of conservation as buildings, we begin with open space armatures. And I, I found this particularly insightful because if you're talking of informality, you're talking of homelessness, you're talking of colossal amounts of people that don't have fundamental shelter, public space improvements, public improvement projects can become a beautiful way of charting urban transformation in a very big sense. Is that something you thought more about? Is that something that could begin to be a torchbearer towards ideas we've not considered as far as the sort of cocoon siloed impression of heritage conservation in India today is concerned? Um, when I, I think absolutely that, that goes without saying. Um, certainly in the city of Mumbai, where we are so starved for open spaces. Uh, for me, uh, the city is made up of so many, especially in India, so many different types of people of different economic levels. And if we need to preserve a city, we need to bring a connection for all people between uh, their activities and the built form. And I think one of the most important ways of doing that is to create these open spaces. They could be the Oval Maidan where they play cricket. It could be along the, um, along the water like we have in, in, uh, in Bandra and places like that. But unless uh, even migrants, even people who come and go from the city, they all have to, to connect with the city. And one of the most important ways of connecting with the city is open spaces, either to walk, to play games, to sit, to chat, because we all come from very small, tiny little homes in, in cities like Mumbai. And that is why this work from home business, which everyone's talking about post pandemic, how is it going to work? You know, you're sitting in a room with three other people of your from your family. So we have to understand that we are very different in every way from the rest of the world. And what might apply there does not apply here. We, each one of us has to look at our own city and see how do we make it relevant to the people who live in our city, whether it's the Ravi, whether it's the Chols, whether it is the colonial buildings, whether it's Art Deco, it doesn't matter. The importance of, I mean, today we heard the coastal road has destroyed the Tata Garden along the Napian Sea Road and all the people there are coming out on Sunday to protest, but the trees have been cut. The car, to me, the car is the biggest single menace that has destroyed our cities and destroying our open spaces. They are taking our land away from the space around heritage buildings. So the heritage buildings are just by themselves. They've lost their meaning. I was looking at some old photographs where in front of VT you had garden some time ago. The coastal road is destroying so much along its route. So we have to address the car. Look what's happening all around the world. There's one good thing we need to do. Till we address vehicular movement, we cannot save our cities. I'm absolutely convinced on that. Very good. Thank you. Riaz, I'm going to move to you. Uh, that was a brilliant uh, provocation, Riaz. I, I, I found your statement particularly insi insightful. The irony when modernism came, and I'll put it in my words, the irony that modernism was never taken through the litmus test of the native public. That's the way I got your message. 
uh, and now modernism is trying to go through a forced litmus test of the public or perhaps is, is denying itself a litmus test of the public. So my question for you was, how do you feel in the context of Ahmedabad and beyond, we can make modern architecture relevant to a demographic that has never associated itself with it. I, I, I feel that anywhere in India, even today, even as an outsider, even, 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 even with, with people I talk to, it continues to remain the a fact, I think, that modernism, modern architecture, however iconic, is very difficult to, to grapple. It, it remains an intellectual endeavor. It remains an exclusive endeavor. And, and it's nice for us to talk about it, but it's... So I'd like to pragmatize your theoretical question, which is a theoretical provocation, which is how do you now make these wonderful things we talk about, modern icons, modern period pieces, relevant to an everyday man? And the question, therefore, by extension is, by what means do you see perhaps some speculations on processes that might change as we begin to think of conservation in other ways? No, thank you. Uh, actually, you know, the, the, the interesting thing is that I actually look at maintenance as being that, uh, that hope and potential. And it's, it's, it's interesting because of the way that the profession of architecture has constituted itself in India uh, in displacing as many modern uh, disciplines have uh, an earlier social relationship that uh, led to building processes. And those were craft based. We know this, it's been well documented and so on. And what it did by, by uh, centering the building as one, uh, as the unit of, uh, uh, of the built environment, what it did was it centralized certain crafts or certain processes that had to do with material. Now, the thing is when in the cycle of these buildings, as they come around and they need help uh, and they need maintenance, Again, the, the engagement is going, to be at, is going to have to be at a much smaller unit where these crafts or parts of buildings are engaged with in that process of maintenance, whether it's plumbing, whether it's, uh, you know, uh, concrete and, uh, you know, renovation of brick, uh, those uh, processes uh, may well be brought together under, let's say, heritage uh, uh, in order to coordinate, but it certainly has the potential of localizing uh, uh, building processes with skills that are available in, in, in the particular places that we uh, find these buildings. So I, I think that maintenance is one part of it, Vinayak. The other part is really looking at how the contexts have changed because these buildings were built, and this is what I was suggesting, that they were built... Uh, say uh, half a century ago, and uh, cities have changed so dramatically that uh, though I completely take Alpa's uh, point that the, the riverfront is uh, an absolute ecological disaster, uh, what it does in terms of making connections um, uh, uh, in terms of urban infrastructure cannot be dismissed. Uh, as much as we can, uh, we would like to talk about the uh, the fact that it is, an, I, in my opinion, the, the bigger ecological problem is the water rather than the, con uh, the concrete. Uh, but that's another discussion. The fact is it is making urban connections that are making these institutions plausible in uh, programmatic terms. And the local, uh, uh, the locality uh, and its engagement with those institutions needs to be rethought. Because and yeah, I think that part of our problem is that we are still looking at the universalist uh, narrative in order to look at heritage. Uh, whether I look at uh, you know the statement made by the municipal commissioner in keeping Sanskar Kendra, it talks about uh, the 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 uh, the infinite the Museum of Infinite Growth. It cites it, uh, and and that keeps it in the intellectual realm, realm rather than think of what kind of programs and what kind of artifacts need to be in that museum. Uh, so, I mean, that's just... Uh, so, Riaz, basically what you're, what you're pointing out is that the act of... can be a, a very practical economic generator. Yes. Uh, and, and looking at uh, looking at the state of buildings as a potential for that rather than as a problem. Okay. Very good. Annabelle, I'm going to move to you. Uh, the key point I got from you is uh, the sort of re-owning of the city. The idea that you can take, instead of thinking of these icons as sort of these incredible untouchables for all the 
uh, expensive reasons and elite reasons. You, you, you cited a very interesting example where a well-known building by a very well-known architect goes beyond the architect, beyond the sort of association of the big name that is associated with it and opens itself up to the city. And the people, ordinary people sort of claim it back. They claim the, the, the building, the heritage is part of the city, right? But what we've often found is the apparent irony that when you take icons and you make them heritage, it often becomes difficult for processes, bureaucratic or otherwise, for people to do what you just described. So in your experience, how do you straddle, straddle this dilemma? Because often what we found is when you, the more designation you give a building, the more important you make a building, the less easy it is for the ordinary everyday to engage with it. So is your case, however wonderful it was, an exception, or do you see this as an actual method to forge a much more sort of diffused process of public engagement with what we now call exclusive heritage in India. You're, you're muted, Annabelle. So I think the point I was trying to make is that we need to, as professionals, bring the dialogue out to the common man. Uh, every case that we have seen, uh, whether it is the Central Vista, it has become an intellectual uh, discussion. It has not gone beyond the realm of uh, the intellectual. Of course, in the case of the Central Vista, there has been a lot of public outroar, but isn't that a little too late? Didn't we know about this development much, much before this? And uh, also another aspect, I think we have to realize that we have to sensitize everybody. We can start with schools, we can start with you know our local RWS. Yes, I agree that this might be a case where if you designate heritage, then it takes it to the realm of, you know, still unapproachable but i think the point i'm trying to make is that we need to get this dialogue out to the common man we need to make people realize the significance of our heritage and also another aspect is we are taking away by all these examples whether it is the sabarmati riverfront development or the central vista what has been lost essentially is a public open space for the people Yes, we as the intellectuals do realize it. The common man won't realize it till there is that chain fence around it and he's not given access to the space. What has happened in the Central Vista in um, Delhi is that a memorial was built right at India Gate. People always are crowded around that space, but after the project was built and that chain fence is there, then uh, people are realizing that they don't have access to the space. So I think before it is even deemed heritage, it's important for us to understand which are our public spaces that matter and how can we engage with them? How can we as professionals get constituencies of people to engage with these spaces and keep them as public spaces? Uh, and well, let, me, let me ask you something here very quickly because this is an important point you're making. Um, I, I, I feel that architects uh, with our great design minds and wiring often do not have the skills to do this. Are you beginning to suggest that other entities like humanitarian organizations, non-government organizations need to be given far greater prominence in this process to make this happen? Yes, it is It is a people's city. We need to, we as architects, since we are the you know caretakers of uh, heritage, we, we are the ones who need to engage other constituencies to get into this dialogue. I think that is the need of the art, whether it is, you know, lawyers, whether it is um, NGOs, we need to get a lot of people involved in this caring for the city. Very good. Okay. <clears throat> Mr. Ravindran, we can have you on the screen. Are you there? I think, I think, ah, there you are. Yeah, I'm on. Yeah, thank you. So uh, the, the, the major message here was, uh, and, and I'll speak as an urban designer myself, Mr. Ravindra, you know, the city comes first, urbanism comes before architecture. So here's my thought, my question for you. I have felt after, you know, 40 years of, uh, of 30 years of confusion and 40 years of whatever of life, that all the heroes who Many of the heroes, I shouldn't say all, I don't want to put words in anyone's mouth, but many of the mighty heroes that created these incredible monuments that we talk about today, 
uh, were not really interested in the market. And I thought your point was spot on because you, you talked about it with the monument versus the market, which is what, what makes the city. And I've always maintained that as great as they were, and I, it's not like they didn't understand the market, but they were able to create these monuments because they were not engaging with the market. So they, I've always felt, and you must correct me if I'm wrong, I've always felt that the great icons of 20th century architecture in India were done either with high budget, iconic projects for great, wonderful patrons, or on the other extreme end, brilliant low income housing projects. But what we've never been able to talk about with a straight face in India is what you pointed out, which is the mainstream market, the market of developers, the market of FSI, the market of, you know, the mainstream middle that makes the 90% mark of our city. So my question to you is, where does urban design come in? As, as one of the, the major voices of urban design in the country, where do you see urban design coming in to transform and shift the rubric of heritage conservation? Because it has, in my opinion, not happened over the past generation. Urban design has remained on the fringe of architectural discussion. How do we bring it center stage? Well, uh, to all order, your question, to answer that question, uh, but extremely relevant question, I agree. But uh, what I'd like to say is that uh, the whole discourse about urban design has slowly begun to shift in India uh, by repeatedly looking at Indian cities and you know, looking at the so-called uh, um, uh, the chaotic or the, uh, the, the dichotomous condition between chaos and order. Yeah? So this is something which Indian urbanism actually has been grappling with in the urban design studios in the last 30 or 35 years that I've been active in the field. Yeah, maybe 40 years I've been active in the field. So uh, one of the things that's happened is that in this attempt to redefine what is urban design, uh, the broadest conclusion that I could come up with is that urban design is the design of the lived experience. It's not an abstracted entity of making blue and green master plans and you know, two dimensional entities and calculation. They're all relevant and important to have. But finally, what matters is what delivers quality of life is the lived experience. And urban design is about the lived experience. So what, to what extent do these big icons that we see in the cities impact that lived experience? is a multifaceted question. It has a very important role to play, just like any work of art has a very important role to play. You, you install a public art structure, everyone walks by, glances at it, and perhaps doesn't interrogate or try to understand it fully, but over a period of time, it grows into the psyche of the person and that has an impact on the lived experience of that person. So very much like an installation that we see, uh, iconic building has an important role to play in creating or modulating the lived experience of people. You know? But that's a broad abstract answer. But in effect, you can look at the, the iconic building like a what on the body, you know? on the body of the city. It's not just about the, the aesthetic or the, the beauty of it or the, for instance, uh, Korea's Kanjanjiga building is a very beautiful building. I admire it fully. You know? But I can also see that it is the, the number of processes that lie behind them are equally important as far as the history of the city is concerned. So the history of the city normally is con con uh, constructed by us. We excavate relevant information and we construct a narrative and we call it history. That construction has been mostly dependent on appearances and you know, kind of stylistic analogies and so on and so forth. Whereas every one of those buildings reveal a very serious condition that is inflicting our cities which is the condition of unbridled investment of capital. And that, when I said market to the monument to the market, 
I mean both of them as metaphors, even the market as a metaphor, you know, not as the financial market, also as a financial market. That has a relevance as well. But the, my mention of the market is actually more as a metaphor. That is Buddha coming down from the mountains to the marketplace. That is your learnings are somewhere, but your communication is on another plane, another platform. A platform which is far more consequential and social in its content. So that is where urban design needs to move towards the social content of our communication. And that communication will only be received by people if we are able to impact positively the lived experience of the people of the city. It's a long discussion. I, sorry, I. Thank you. This is wonderful. Thank you. Thank you. I'm going to move to. Uh, I'm going to move to Sangeeta Ji. Sangeeta, you and I have spoken about this before, but uh, I'm going to raise this question in the context of Chandigarh. And we've spoken about this, so I, I, I think you should elaborate on it. You have yourself written about how today retirees in Chandigarh cannot afford the rents of the city, right? I mean, we've talked about this. Uh, because Chandigarh land prices are rising, they're going beyond. Uh, the city is sprawling, uh, uh, eating nature uh, around it. Uh, at the same time, you you talk about a modern heritage city, which has avenues that are three times as big as they ought to be in terms of the amount of asphalt that's contained in them, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. We've talked about the fact that despite the monsoons, Chandigarh has a water shortage so on and so forth. So my question is, we all stand inspired by Chandigarh as you know this iconic sort of unique city in India. As an extension of the question I asked Mr. Ravindran, while the heritage aspirations for Chandigarh continue, how do you see other disciplines coming in to more intellig intelligently tackle the contemporary current problems of the city? beyond just a heritage rubric. And the reason I'm asking you this is because what has happened in my opinion is everyone thinks of Chandigarh as an iconic city. We don't talk enough of the obvious problems that it is facing, which are really quite shocking. So if you could quite talk about that and address them in some form, uh, which you, I know you've talked about, that would be quite nice. Thank you, Vinayak, for your question. Uh... My first take on this is that when we say Chandigarh is generally known, quote unquote, as the iconic city of Kabusia, that itself is a misnomer because the real city does not lie in Kabusia, however much we may glorify it. The real city is the city of the people, the city which is made by the sectors. And the sectors are made by the neighborhoods and the neighborhoods are the people's places. And they are the elementary schools, the colleges, the health infrastructure. The, and it is, it is the space which the people negotiate. And with this is this open space structure. And together the two form the rubric of the city. Now, when there are two parts to your question. The first is about uh, fossilizing the iconic nature of the city. Fossilization cannot be done to a living city. We are seeing the change. It is coming in. For example, a small, small little example. We have docking stations now for cycles under the smart city program in almost every other sector. And people are actually beginning to cycle in the city irrespective of their social and economic status. That, it's, it's a very minuscule example, but it is changing the way people are using Chandigarh. For two almost uh, or 25 years, it was a car city. We, we had no space to park. And now people are changing that attitude. So people are investing in high quality bicycles. So there is a change and the change that any city can bring in is by its people. Uh, politicians and uh, bureaucracy cannot bring the change which people can bring. And the people of Chandigarh do realize this, and they're a very educated lot. So that has made a difference. The second part of your question was that affordability. No doubt the 
prices are exorbitant, people who retire from the government uh, sector who have been living in the heart of the city because they were living in tenured accommodation have to give that up and go into the suburbia, which is really not as well managed as, as the main city. Now, that's where the efforts should be actually relies on, a, it needs a public transportation system. That public transportation that Brinda also mentioned is going to be the saving grace of Chandigarh and actually allow people to stay within its hinterland or within the area that we call the, the, the peri-urban area of Chandigarh because Chandigarh is no longer the eight square kilometer grid that we know of. It is now Chandigarh, Mohali, Panchkula, the peri-urban and people are actually working in Chandigarh and residing there. So the success story of Chandigarh, the next step is actually to build a mass public transport system, which would be linked to the bicycle system and thereby make Chandigarh more affordable. Obviously, everybody can't live in the core of Chandigarh, but we need to make more such Chandigars. And that's where the role of urban planning and other dimensions beyond architecture would come. So we, we need to think of the embedded geography of Chandigarh and we need to think of the hinterland around and how these connections can actually make this city not burst at its seams and at the same time allow for smaller Chandigars to come up. There was something which was done in 1984 with EFN Ribeiro handling the team called the SISMA plan, which is the Chandigarh Interstate Metropolitan Regional Development Plan. Maybe it was an idea at that point of time and the city was not ready for it. But today we need to look at that plan. We need to revisit that plan because it has to be dovetailed into our planning process in order. And that's where our research studies at the CCA are heading. We are engaging with the academy as it engaging with students, with researchers, with scholars from outside the college, with the university and with the CRICS institutions, which is the Regional Innovation Knowledge Cluster. And it brings in geographers, it brings in sociologists, it brings in a host of other you know, specialists who can actually make this system work. Very good, so thank you. Thank you, Sangeeta. Uh, Susan, a short question. You have the advantage of being you know, sort of the onlooker from a very different vantage point. What can India, in this context, teach the rest of the world? Certainly, it can something. I, I think that um, the rest of the world is, at the moment, learning some things from the work of um, Indian professionals that are in the realm that, that I'm inhabiting right now. And that is a number of different things. I mean, I think it's firstly um, expanding and exposing the very different modernities and how they played out in different places that was specific in response to, you know, space, time, geography and people. Because I think we've had a very rigid understanding about what, the, what modern architecture is, what modern heritage is, how we should deal with it and how we should approach it. So I think just the basic understanding of, of what these places are and how people respond to them, how they used, what they were made of, a whole range of things. I think that India has been one of the countries that has responded more quickly to this shift in thinking about how to go about conserving modern heritage from it being completely constrained to thinking about it as capital A architecture and structural innovation and things that are more, um, you know, maybe how we might have looked, you know, that relate more to this sort of monumental value and this recognition that social value is really important. It's about people's connection to place um, and that we need to um, embrace those concepts in terms of not just understanding why things are important, how they might value it, and then how we might go about conserving them. So I think that's, and I think particularly um, for modern heritage, I think there's sort of been an ongoing 
um, resistance to thinking that modern heritage can have other values and can have in, intangible attributes as well as tangible attributes. I think so. I think what's been um, I'm really fascinated by and really enjoying seeing those discussions coming out of India. You know the cases that I think we've seen some some of today. And then I think there's also this question about thinking it in in the context of urbanity. Um, you know, of course, there are modern cities in different places that are sort of tackling it in a in a in a very specific way. But I think it's this sort of um, the palimpsest. You know, the thinking about how these places then relate to different periods of history and where there's been significant shifts in how society works and you know who's in charge and then you know how it's structured around that and then how we respond to these periods of architecture of urbanity um, before it. I think it's really interesting, the discussions and the debates that are coming um, from, um, from India at the moment. And um, I think there's a lot for the rest of us to sort of be observing and, and uh, enjoying and, and learning from that. Thank you, that's wonderful. Arun, uh, in that order, uh, again, you have the you know, unique position of being sort of the engineering mind. Uh, my question to you is quite sort of ironic in a way, but it's, it's I think you, you I want to hear your vantage point because it will be a unique one, I think. Uh, when we talk about tectonics and materials, which is such an important aspect of heritage, typically the discussion inevitably shifts, shifts to issues of authenticity, and, and which is a very difficult word because you pointed out a lot of sort of practicalities that need to emerge, context change, times change, uh, economies change, and as a result, we're simply not able to give sort of tectonic authenticity to a monument, etc. As an engineer, not as an architect, but to put sort of your structural engineering hat on, because you do wear many hats, uh, where do you see this subject? Is it even relevant in the context of 20th century architecture in India today? That's a very tough question. Well, that's, I'm, uh, that's why I'm asking you. The question of authenticity, and, uh, it needs to be defined and it needs to be defined to different professionals who engage with uh, the building, the infrastructure. And uh, I look at authenticity in a slightly different way. Um, I give this example in my class and that is, let's say, there is a, a building which has a beautiful arch, a structural arch, and um, there is a structural safety problem there. And you need to bring in someone to repair, uh, fix that situation. One of the solutions would be to um, introduce, hide away a beam above the arch and make that construction look safe, salvage the arch um, and, and make the structure safe, make that, uh, that construction safe. Now, there is, there is an ethical question here, or a moral question here. Is that solution doing justice to the, uh, to the essence of the building in the first place? You were, you're short circuiting the building's way of handling uh, forces. So I think the, the word authenticity needs to be uh, elaborated from different perspectives first. And then we run into, of course, we run into uh, challenges of um, execution, the possibility of executing, constructability, and so on. I'll tell you the, the, the few slides that I showed you uh, at Rashtrapati Bhavan has been such a nightmare of a, a project. A, a part of a project, which is the, the sunshades meant to be in sandstone. It's a grade A building meant to be in sandstone, executed those two meter long sunshades, executed in lime concrete, God knows why. They were using cement concrete in that building anyway, but they decided to do the sunshades in lime concrete. But then since they were cantilevers, they had to be reinforced. So you've got reinforcement and lime together and waiting to fall apart and falling apart today uh, in the uh, first citizen's house in front of all his guests. 
so you know today we are trying to say grade a building you need to you can't change everything you can't say pull out all the sunshades and and put new sunshades uh, we want to save something we tried to start working on uh, saving the lime concrete with the steel reinforcement it just fell apart and we now have the good quality steel still hanging there and trying to cover it with concrete you know doing all these gymnastics here and sometimes i ask myself why what are we trying to what are we trying to save uh, latians would latians might already be cross with the fact that the sandstone was replaced with lime concrete uh, and the pwd that executed that in lime concrete with the steel there is not is really not bothered about that element i'm just focusing on one small element but i'm, I'm saying there are several layers to this authenticity issue and uh, you know i don't know if i answered the question but it's a it's a, it's a thank challenging you that's great point that's that's it's it's a, it's a tricky one that's why i asked you the question particularly from an engineering perspective i'm going to move to alpa alpa you shifted the discourse to the subject of ecology among other things okay but i'm not going to talk about that my question is um uh, you know when we begin to think about uh the relevance of conservation in a place like india i uh, i'm going to shift for a minute to i always think about the, what was happening in paris and we, and and we all talk about the hospitalization of paris the destruction of the city with these big boulevards but at the same time there was another gentleman viole ledu who was doing a lot of things which is the reason paris is what it is today so uh, question that you alluded to is you know in many ways something that riyas touched upon as well all of these icons and modernism in india came at the price of enormous destruction of traditional cities not just the physical destruction but also the intellectual erasure of the irrelevance of the traditional city it really came as a wave uh, and and inundated india um should our should our priorities shift big time therefore and is is that the key point you were trying to make and if so by what means and methods can we begin to think about these and are they ecological priorities or are they populist priorities or what other priorities do you see uh, in the world of conservation rather than strictly that of built monumentality uh, so i'll just start with saying that first of all you know as engineers we are trained to look at issues neutrally right so um, i'm able to see the irony of how liberals in the united states will encourage and participate in dismantling of confederate statues right and and the liberals in india also me included uh, consider those to be vestiges of an unequal world of slavery whatever but then we are appalled and so am i when the present regime has brought the idea uh, has bought has bought the idea uh, you know very very savagely uh, uh, you know uh, projected to them of reimagining a new image of india uh, and making a clean break with the colonial image right so it's all about the narratives and who presents a picture but you know i think the larger part is whose city is it and who has the claim to define what a city should be like and i think architects and planners must understand that they are like the blindfolded men feeling the elephant you know an economist view of what makes a city is so completely different do you think that the decision of any uh, any migrant who is coming to the city is any way linked to the city the the monuments it has the conservation of it what are they looking at they are just looking at the availability of a job of safety and affordable housing right so so i think that we need to address the very urgent and important issues and yes i think climate change has to be the first thing that we need to look at and if i have a big problem about the central vista it is about i mean we must be joking how many you know tens of thousands of cubic meters of concrete we are just putting where nothing was required to be done to me that is more of a dilemma than you know the the romance of of what we have over there i love it but but you know that that's okay i i appreciate the right of any regime to, to 
to have their own image of India. But, you know, I would just ask one question that if conservation of some structures, and, you know, I, I heard somebody say that, oh, this was the first uh, time this kind of a cantilever structure, even if it was, it, it, uh, you know, there were, there were other uh, things happening elsewhere in the world, which are bigger. But even let's assume that, that we were doing some architectural feats. You know, I mean, in, in the world today that we live in, Engineering for for sure is has gotten much much uh, better and more developed, and we can do whatever was done in the fifties and sixties in a much leaner, sleeker way. So I think today we have tools of a virtual experience of heritage, right? We can even stick haptics into it, and we can make it feel like real heritage. We live in the age of digital technology, right? We need to use that and we don't need to be having these fossilized physical structures, which really don't mean anything to the millennials or the Generation Z. They don't have any patience. And I think we have to seed ground. The world now is going to be belonging to them and we need to pass the baton. Thank you. Thank you. I'd just like to open the stage before I say a few final words and pass it on to Poonam for any final thoughts. Now that we heard each other, are there any final pointers that anyone would like to talk about? Um, before we do that, I think Riyas, would you address one question that is there from a student who said you would love to? So the, I, I assume this is the, uh, uh, the question by Maharshi. That's right? Yes. Yes. Yeah, so how can we find a creative solution for the revitalization of dilapidated uh, uh, heritage structures which were built pre-independence. I think we're all <laughs> trying to find that out and uh, struggling with, uh, you know, how one engages in different, in different contexts. I think, uh, you know, uh, Marshi, if I was uh, uh, working in Bombay like uh, uh, Brinda does, I think the, the way that one would navigate that question would be quite different from the way one has to do it in Ahmedabad. There, there are different cultures in different cities and there are different contexts as well. And therefore, I think um, part of what I, I, what I was suggesting earlier that one has to be locally present, uh, one has to engage with, as we've been talking about, the, uh, a, a much larger sphere of social and uh, practice, a larger sphere of practices that uh, you know, inhabit this uh, this process, it's not an easy solution. It's not about, in fact, if it was, uh, if I could give you an answer uh, that would be universal to all contexts, it would be precisely the problem that we are uh, stating right now, that, you know, there's there's a one solution fix all, which there isn't. So my, my, my sense is the first thing one has to do is uh, engage with that heritage as a citizen uh, and then look at it uh, uh, from the perspective of how one can bring one's professional expertise into play. Uh, often you will be playing uh, much more the role of a citizen and your, your, your professional role might become peripheral at other times with other questions that comes to the fore. Uh, so I, I don't know, I, there is no easy way to answer your question. I, I'll just leave my response to that. I'd be happy to get into it because you said this is about your thesis. Uh, I'd be happy to uh, get, if you got in touch and we can get into a, a more detailed discussion uh, online or on the phone. Thank you. Thank you, Riaz. Uh, I would just like to say two uh, interesting emerging ideas and I would take it that maybe finally we can all be on the same plane and a platform which is about climate change. And if we look at our responsibility towards whether we look at it from heritage conservation point of view, or we look at um, sustainability development, the common lens which we have been missing up till now is perhaps this portal of climate change. I'm just going to leave it at that because when I go over to you for this particular, um, this is a, a very interesting and I think the dialogue has just begun. Well, I'd like to give one more minute to the panelists since you heard each other, because I have a few final words before we end the evening. But would you like to say anything now that any rebuttals or any response to other people's comments? Okay. 
Well, I just want to end with a personal episode. Uh, well, two episodes actually, one related to Chandigarh and one outside India, but they both come back to, I think the key points that were binding everyone's sort of rubrics today. Uh, Sangeeta, I think I, you've heard me say this before. I visited Chandigarh 15 years after I graduated from architecture school. I had never seen Chandigarh. So I went with my camera to take photographs of the famous Corbusier buildings in the capital. And I felt so duped because all of the books that I had read as a great fan of Corbusier, my childhood days, and my young architecture days, had shown me photographs only of Corbusier's original buildings. They had completely denied me of the actual history of that place. I had not seen any barbed wires. I had never seen people. They were all edited, kept clean, and the sculptural formality of the buildings was what dominated it. So I felt every single person who had written these books had lied to me point blank. That was my first observation about Chandigarh. Years later, I was in Tokyo, going from Shibuya station to Yoyogi Park up the hill with a very eminent architect whose name I will not take today. And we were walking and we crossed by the famous Yoyogi Stadium designed by Kenzo Tange in the 60s, which is another great monument of 20th century architecture. And my eminent friend pulled out his camera in excitement. And in front of the Yoyogi Stadium, there was a farmer's market going on. So he started to take his camera and then he said, damn it, when I, I can't get a proper shot of that building because the farmer's market is blocking my view. So I just like to end with this note that I think what brings this all together, what all of you suggested in some way or the other today is perhaps what we really need to do is notice the farmer's markets in front of our icons. I think they come first. And if we can preserve them, conserve them, renew them, then we talk about what's in the background. I want to thank everyone today evening. This has been one of the best panels I've ever been, had the privilege of hearing uh, Punam, You've been the brainchild behind this, so you will have the final word. Thank you for making me part of this as well. My thank you, Vinay, for, for sharing your personal experience, which indeed I, I can share with you about the Chandigarh too, but this is now time for uh, QTV. I hope uh, we have aligned our efforts towards rethinking capacity and be more responsible as whichever professional we are. So over to you for your uh, comments. Thank you. Uh, unfortunate part of the story is this, that is, uh, let me see, let me see if I, uh, can you hear me? Can you, do you hear me? Okay. Uh, oh, thank you very much. And also wonderful panel. And uh, before I do my customary sort of thank you for everyone, uh, I'm, 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 I'm very inclined to kind of say a few things on the subject itself. And uh, it is already 12.35, so we're running 35 minutes you know, beyond our schedule. And, and still I, 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 feel, I feel compelled to kind of say a few things. Uh, and because I don't have time, uh, there will be all three of them provocative statement. If I had more time, I'd explain to them. Number one, we essentially got to be talking about three cities, city as a place, city as a people, and city as economy. And if you really look at the role of the architects, and this is the provocative part, my own personal reading is this, we have architects have failed in all three. City as a place, they never contributed to it, making it for the larger people, a big number of people. They were essentially confined to making small products there and there. City as a people, they have never looked at people anywhere, anything they've done. And city as economy, they don't even understand. And, and therefore, I think you know, this is a larger kind of you know, dialogue, but I thought I'll just make a provocative statement that, uh, that there has been a major problem in terms of role of the architects in the context of, of cities. Second point I would like to make is this, that uh, in a, I think about 25, 30 years ago, there was a very interesting workshop or seminar at Indian Institute of Management. I'm oh, sorry, at, at, at NID Ahmedabad. And it was called Design for Development. 
And uh, Romesh Thapar was a keynote speaker. I was very young at that time, but I've never forgotten what he said. He asked a very interesting question. He said, waves of vulgarity are invading our cities. And he said, when you talk about the role of a designer, and in this particular context, I'm talking about the role of the architect. He said, I don't know what is the role of, an, uh, of a sensitive architect. Does he put up one sensitive building among 99 ugly, or does he really kind of work towards sensitizing a city and society which doesn't produce such ugly landscape? And I think this is very important to look at because uh, Russian says that you know, they play music in their cow sheds and music, and, and music gives, and the cows give more milk. They are more productive. And if cows are, 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 are sensitive to music, human beings certainly are to spaces. And what kind of cities and what kind of spaces we are creating is an issue we've got to look at and architects must contribute to that happening. And my third little point is this. If they say that, that the history of hunting was written by lions, it would have been very, very different. If you look at Chandigarh from bottom-up perspective, it would appear that selection of Kubuzir as a designer for that was a historical mistake. Because when we're designing a city, Kubuzir obviously was a genius. But genius don't listen to people, they listen to themselves. And designing a city in a context like India requires understanding people, understanding climate, understanding people, understanding tradition, understanding ways of doing things. They never had the time. And therefore they created a city which was good for themselves, not for the pity. And therefore I think with these three provocative statements, if there's more time, and uh, Alpaji, if you had more time, we'll discuss also, I think, Riverfront Development in Ahmedabad. But uh, uh, thank you very much, I think, Punamji, and thank you very much, Manak Saab, for this remarkably rich uh, uh, webinar. Uh, uh, it has been kind of in planning for a long time, and uh, but for your support and but for your contribution, uh, this would not have been possible. Uh, especially this richness uh, in terms of choosing panelists and 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 uh, moderating it so beautifully. Uh, I must thank this incredibly rich panel, and I think the the even though there is not enough time, uh, I must thank everyone personally because they've enriched this process very much. And therefore, thank you, Brinda ji. Thank you, Kitty Ravinder Saab ji, Sangeeta ji, Suzanne. Dr. Arun Manan, Anna, uh, uh, Annabel Lopez, uh, Tayabji Sabhai, and Alpaji. It was remarkable uh, and the manner in which you, know, you express yourself is, is very, very rich. And let me kind of take this opportunity to thank my colleague uh, at the studio in half for all the hard work behind the scene, especially Ankisha, Kea, Alika, Nita, and, and Rajesh ji, uh, they have been working very hard uh, for a long time uh, and, 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 and success of this uh, webinars very much is to them as well. So thank you very much uh, for being there. Uh, uh, I don't know whether Pranamji mentioned this, but this is uh, hopefully a series. This was the first episode of, this, of the series. We hopefully will come with the second one uh, the time is not decided, date is not decided, but we will take care to see that you're informed when it happens. So thank you very much uh, for, to everyone. Thank you. Bye-bye.